Uh, <clears throat> you know, as pastors, we hear a lot of silly things out there, such as contradictions in the Word of God, like, well, in one place it says Jonah was swallowed with a well, in another place it was a fish, and I said, okay, it's a well shark, if that's your biggest argument, I don't want to hear it. And that's the same thing with the Gospels. When you take the four Gospels count, there's only one Gospel, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, who died for us. That's the Gospel in a nutshell. He bore our sins. But there's four different viewpoints of people seeing it. So it's kind of like a car accident. If we've seen a car accident where Tracy's standing, he can say, yeah, that car just swerved out and hit somebody. And Joe on the other side said, yeah, but there was a kid in the road. He didn't want to hit the kid. And the other one said, the car that hit him sped off what it was. And they looked at Dwayne, and Dwayne said, it's 1937 Duesenberg. Uh, spoke to Wills. But you see what I'm saying? We see it in different viewpoints. All right? That's what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John did. With Mark, he seems to go at it at a quicker pace. And so it's the shorter of the Gospels. And sometimes I wish he would have just slowed down a little bit. So I'm going to help him slow down just a little today. As Jim left it out on Mark, he did the communion table. So I'm going to touch on the communion table. You do realize that that was the table that the Father prepared for us. The blood represents Jesus' blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of sin. The, the bread was the body that was bruised for our healing. But it says he was crucified from the foundations of the earth. So the Father prepared that table for it. And through these events we're going to see, it was all ordained by the Father for you and for me. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And he loves you so much that he set it up that Jesus would die. But understand, Jesus was as much flesh as he was God. So when we hear him say, take this cup from me, the flesh was saying, this is going to be painful. But the son always surrendered to the will of the father. We need to surrender to the will of our heavenly father. And the problem with it in the church today, nobody seems to like the word submission. So we're going to start out in Mark the 14th chapter. They just had communion. And if I was going to title this as being a disciple or one of the 12, it would have been the best of times, the worst of times, to again the best of times. Because when they came, he came in riding on the donkey, everybody was saying, Hosanna. And I could see the disciples saying, yes, the people got it. And then they have communion. And they say, it can't get any better than this. But then he gets arrested. And they're wondering how bad can it be? <clears throat> but he dies on the cross. And it seems like hopelessness has took over. But in three days he rose again. Amen? I often wonder what Joseph of Arimathea did when he gave up the tomb, and it was an expensive tomb, and he takes this tomb and he gives it to Jesus. I can see him going home and looking at his wife, and she's saying, well, well what, what have you done? He goes, I gave away the tomb. Well, why would you give away our tomb? And he looked at her and said, honey, it's okay. He's only borrowing it for three days. <laughs> Amen? And if you didn't know, he is the Son of God. But in Mark, the 14th chapter, verse 27, Jesus makes this staunch reality, and he said, You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. That prophecy is found in Zechariah 13, 7. It says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is close to me declares the Lord Almighty. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Jesus knew what was coming. He knew God had a plan. Aren't you thankful that God doesn't show you what's coming up next for you? 
We don't know. I thank God that he has shown me some of the things coming up in my future. But Jesus continued. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. The problem with Peter is he's on the wrong side of the cross. He doesn't have the Holy Spirit. Peter is speaking out of the flesh. I'm a tough guy. I'm not going to fall away. He's on the wrong side of the cross, so I think we ought to give him a break. We see it that we have the Word of God. We can pick up the Word of God. We see the beginning from the end. Peter didn't. The other disciples didn't. They walk by more faith than me and you do. They're trusting that he is the Son of God. We have the written Word. We have the Holy Spirit. We have a better viewpoint than Peter did. So I tell people, cut them some slack. But Jesus says, truly I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter said, even if I have to die, I will never disown you. All the others said the same. I like John, in the Gospel of John, the 16th chapter. They go through the communion. First he washes their feet. They take the bread. And throughout all of it, he's teaching them. In Matthew, we get a running point. But in John, Jesus starts telling them about the Holy Spirit. He said, hey, I got something better coming. He said, hey. In John 16, 13, he said, but when the Holy Spirit... Of truth. He will speak not of his own. He will speak only what he hears. That doesn't come till Acts. But see, I like the teaching aspect of Jesus. He always taught his disciples. Yes, I'm going away. But he said, I'm risen again. They didn't hear that. They said, no, no, no. He goes, you're going to disown me. No, not me. But a lot of times our actions, our deeds... Tell us we do disown Jesus. By gossip, backbiting. How about not witnessing? Are you saying I'm not a Christian? If your actions don't speak louder than your words, are you disowning God? Somewhere along the line, our actions should line up with the Word of God through the Holy Spirit. And we should walk a godly life. There's no shortage of false preachers that don't want to talk about holiness and forgiveness and repentance. See, these guys are going to repent, but then they're going to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. So as Christians, if we're going to walk in the line of Jesus and we're not going to deny him, then we got to stand up for what is just and what is right and call sin, sin. Not an alternative in lifestyle. We say it's a choice when it's a life. Somewhere we miss the message. But the Bible tells us in end times we'll have itching ears. Only wanting to hear what sounds good. It's easily when people come up to you and say, Oh, brother, you're doing good. God is going to bless you. He's going to bless your coming in, bless your going out. He doesn't tell you what you're going to go through to receive it. See, God talks about the pain that Jesus is about to suffer. Jesus knows the reality that lies before him. And because he loves you and me, he said, I will go. He didn't have to. He said, I will lay down my life. Nobody takes it from me. I lay it down. Because it's the only way that we could have a relationship with God. But the pain is real. So they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter and James and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed in trouble. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. 
Have you ever been there? When life just seems to pour everything out on you and you drop to your knees and you feel the pain and the pain is great. When your spouse walks up and says, I don't want to be here no more. Or your child dies in a car accident. Or the doctor says there's no hope. It's terminal. When you find yourself in that place, I want you to be on your knees and reach out for the hem of his garment. I want you to reach a little farther (coughs) and grab a hold of his hand and don't let go. Whatever you do, don't let go. When the storms of life crash, don't let go. He will see you to the other side. But don't let go. I see people get that way, and they throw in the towel. Where are you going to go? Now your whole ship is sinking. Hang on to the hand. Hang on to it. When all hope is lost, he's your only hope. The reality of life will hit everybody. And when you go through that fire, he said he won't leave you, nor will he forsake you. He's got the scars to prove it. He said, as far as the east is from the west, so he has removed your transgression to remember him no more. Thank you. The holes are there as a reminder to you and me what he's done for us. The deliverance he gave us. He promises life eternal. But he says after you've done all you can do, he said stand and hold on to him. Because life's storms can be rough. But if you're in the boat with him, you'll be okay. For Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except Through me. We have the answer for everything in life. We have it for cancer. We have it for pornography, for homosexuality, for transgender. It's all found in one name. What name is that? What name? What name? You have the answer. Now share the answer. That's what we're called to do. If we're not sharing it, they don't hear. If they don't hear, they have no hope. God has called every one of us to be a witness. And if you're not being a witness, you're denying him. We are called to be a witness. People say, how do you witness? I just look for opportunities. Gailey and I went to Wendy's one day. We love Wendy's Frosty, so we're like, hey, let's go get some fries and a Frosty. Of course, I eat more than her, so I said, well, I want a hamburger to go with my fries and my Frosty. And as we're sitting there, a girl walks up, and she's shaking. I can tell she's homeless. She's a younger lady. Her voice is crackling. And she said... Can you feed me? Uh, Nobody. Nobody grows up thinking, I want to be an addict. I want to be an alcoholic. I want to be hooked on pornography. Nobody goes through that. The stress of life with not knowing Jesus Christ causes people to run into all kinds of stuff out there. And this young lady looks, and I said, sure. I'd love to buy you a meal. But I don't want to leave it with that. So I go up. I go, what do you want? Just hamburger. I said, order whatever you want. If you want one for later, that's fine too. And she orders a meal, and I hear her name. And now I know her name's Kelsey. Gives me somebody to pray for. And I said, I want to tell you something, girlfriend. Jesus loves you. He loves you. And I made sure the cashier could hear it too. He loves you. All you got to do is call out to him. And I walked back to my seat, and I sat down with Galen, and we finished our Frosties. There's opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ 
and yet the church remains silent. Everybody's coming out of the closet but the Christian. He's afraid. He's scared. He's embarrassed. It breaks my heart. The other day they had a suicide awareness month last month on the job site. And they gathered around, and they didn't let me know they were going to talk about it. So on Thursday when I, they talked about it, I go, can I share tomorrow uh, that I'm a minister to let them know if they need counseling, we'll get them counseling. And so the next day came around, the whole job site gathers together, and I said, in case any of you didn't know, I am a pastor. And I want you to know that Jesus loves you. And if you're suffering from anything and you need someone to talk to, come see me and I'll give you my phone number. We can go out with coffee. If it's deeper than that, I'll get you counseling. But you don't have to be in this alone. And always remember God loves you. It wasn't that hard. It took about five minutes, less than that. I'm a preacher, so it could have been longer. Yeah. So what we got to realize is take the opportunity. Gaylene came up to me the other day. She goes, hey, I listened to you. I go, you did? She goes, yeah, there was a cashier. I knew I, uh, she couldn't get mad at me, so I told her Jesus loves you. Amen. She shared right there. She didn't care. That's what we're called to do. We have the answer for everything out there in one name. He will deliver them. He will redeem them, and he will set them free. The only difference between them and us is they're still living on the other side of the cross. We crossed over. We accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. That's what we want. Your worst enemy you ever met. He's one prayer away from becoming a child of the king. Your child is one prayer away from accepting Jesus Christ into his life. Don't give up on unanswered prayer. Pray earnestly like Jesus prayed. Pray. And expect to hear. I stand on the word of God. And when all hope's lost, remember the scripture. Don't forget the word of God. Charles Spurgeon was once asked, what's more important, prayer or reading the word of God? He goes, what's more important to you, breathing in or breathing out? That made perfect good sense to me. They work together. Do not give up on your prayers. Do not give up on your prayers. God hears you. He hears you. Jesus said his father never sleeps. The human side Wanted to cup the past. But Jesus said in John 6, 38 to 40, I want to <laughs> read this to you. It actually starts out in verse 37 of John. All those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up in the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last days. Our hearts, our purpose, should be to do the Father's will. And the problem with the Father's will is there's people that don't even know what his will is, and it's contained in my hand. I could pull it up on my phone. There's times at work I just sit there and read. I always play the worship music when I'm there. We have the word. I have a hard time when a Christian comes along, I'm born again, and I don't think he can name the New Testament books, let alone any of the Old Testament books. How are you going to put on the armor of God that you're going to need in the day of battle because you're going to be driven to your knees? Sooner or later, you will be there. And if you don't know what the sword does, it doesn't do you no good. You can't say, by his stripes I am healed. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. 
you don't know the word, what are you going to pray? We got to be in our word daily. We got to be on our knees daily. We need to keep a tight rein on our tongue. Uh, let's get back to Mark, the 37th verse. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and he prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, aren't you glad Jesus is patient with you? Honestly, I look at this and this doesn't surprise me. I look at it how many times that I failed, but he still loves me. How many times I probably should have spoke when I didn't or when I spoke when I shouldn't have. You know, it's kind of like Paul says, the things I want to do, those things I don't do. But the things I don't want to do, those are the things I do do. And Paul goes, I'm confused. And I'm like, I like Paul because I get the same way. I like Peter because he shows me he's as human as the rest of us. We like to put our foot in our mouth, speak before we think. See, if Jesus said, I'm going to the cross, I'm going to die. You're going to deny me because the scripture says so. That should have been good enough. But Peter had to stick out his chest and said, Oh, Lord, not me. I got your back. I imagine how much that broke Peter down. It had to be a painful experience. And all of us go through life in painful experience. But whatever you do, hang on. He's coming back. Hang on. You'll pass through the troubled waters. If Jesus is in your boat, you're not going to sink. Uh, one of the hardest things I went through years ago was a uh, divorce. And I got alone with God, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I sought God, and the pain was real. My kids didn't speak to me. Nobody speak to me. My wife walked out and said, I don't want this. Reality hit home. And I'm on my knees, and I get away, and I get away from everybody. I go to Kansas City, take a job there where nobody knows my name. And I pray, and I seek the face of God, and all I have is Jesus. But that's all you need. That's all I had. Everything in my life was gone. All I had was Jesus. And I remember coming back when God finally healed the mind so I wouldn't go out and kill somebody. Um just speaking honestly. And I got my mind right, and God started speaking to me, and we're alone in prayer, and I'm doing everything I can, and uh, God said, it's time for you to go back home. And when I came home, I was in my right mind, and a pastor friend of mine, Buddy, uh, I was an associate pastor, he was a pastor, and uh, he goes, oh, no, 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 I knew you'd be all right. What? He goes, I knew you'd be all right. I go, how did you know that I would be okay? I didn't know I would be okay. And he looked at me, he goes, it's simple. I know the God you serve. Amen. I didn't look at it that way. My God was bigger than all my problems. He was bigger. But all I see is the flesh part of me. But he never left me. He didn't forsake me. All I had to do was hang on. That's all I had to do was hang on. And I hung on. It's all I had. But it was all I needed. Oh. 41, returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Wow. What a tough pill to swallow. You pour out your life into somebody for three and a half years. 
You teach them. You love them. You're committed to them. And they betray you. I had to break Jesus' heart. I liked what Doug said years ago. He goes, what would happen if he would have asked for forgiveness? It had to break Jesus' heart to know that one that he spent all that time with, loving on, teaching, grooming. He said, no, nope, I don't want this. How did this break the Lord's heart when we talk about people when we shouldn't? When we're not the godly example in our home. When we don't love our wives as God called us to. When we don't submit to our husbands like Jesus said. Rebellion goes a long ways. There's a lot that all of us can work on. There's a lot that I have to work on. I pray all the time, God, make me a better man. Make me a better husband. Make me a better witness. Make me a better example. Help me to be a better husband, to love my wife properly. I never pray, God, deal with Galen. Boy, I'm going to pay for that one after church. <laughs> Sorry, baby, I love you. But I don't do that. Because when I'm in prayer, God's dealing with Dwayne. He's not dealing with anybody else. He's dealing with me. I remember talking to my kids. Paul, or Levi and Caleb would always fight. And I'd first deal with Caleb. Then I'd send him to his room. Then I'd deal with Levi. And I remember Levi said, but you don't know what he did. I'm not dealing with him right now. I already dealt with him. I'm dealing with you. When I'm in prayer with God, he's not dealing with nobody else around me. He's dealing with me. And that's where I need to be. I'll be honest with you. Not everything that God tells me I'm happy with. And, but I always got to repent. Say, sorry, Lord. So many times I wish I was more like Jesus. To love the unlovable. You know how I know he loves the unlovable? Because he loved me. He loved you. Before I was saved, there wasn't much to even like. But he loved me. He loves you. He has your best interest at heart. He loves you. Never forget that. No matter what you go through, never forget that. 43. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priest, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Really an armed escort? Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with him. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. What a way to be betrayed. The men seized Jesus, arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, Jesus said? that you have come out with me with swords and gloves to capture me. Every day I spoke while I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scripture must be fulfilled. The will of the Father must be accomplished. Because the only way for salvation to buy back humanity was for him to go to that cross. The only chance we had was Jesus. Jesus knew it. He said, you could arrest me any time. He said, you came like cowards in the night. Understand the Sanhedrin. At this time, Joseph Caiaphas would have been the high priest. Next to him would have been Ananias, his father-in-law. Talk about a corrupt group of individuals. Both of them belonged to the Sanhedrin. Both of them were Sadducees. 
So I pondered that. Being Sadducees, they didn't believe in the resurrection. Therefore, they didn't really believe in judgment. So they really didn't care. They were in it for the money. They were in it for the fancy chair to everybody come up to them and give them respect. But unfortunately, there is accountability from all of us. It said every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Jesus Christ is Lord. See, Caiaphas thought, ah, I'll get rid of him. We're not short any bad priests or pastors in today's age either. There's a lot of them that aren't preaching the truth. They call themselves men of God. Their actions speak other words. If it ain't based on Jesus Christ died for the, your sins, he is the son of God, then it's false teaching. If they're pre preaching finances instead of repentance, there might be a problem there. If they're preaching the blessing without holiness, there might be a problem there. Have you ever re read, without holiness, no man see God? Thank God for the blood of Jesus. I had a guy at work one day while we were walking in. He knew I was a pastor. Shared with him several times. And he piped up and he said, hey, you know I don't believe in God. I said, cool. I go, when you meet him, you get to tell him how great you are and st stand on your own merits. Me, knowing that I'm a dirtbag, I'm going to stand on the merit of Jesus Christ who never sinned. And when God looks at me, I'm going to point to Jesus. And he looks at me and he goes, no, 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 no. He goes, no, I don't want that. I go, sounds to me, you need a savior. His name's Jesus. I can help you with that. Reality struck home. So yeah, I get all kinds of silly comments. Oh, before the Sanhedrin, they took Jesus to the high priest, that would be Joseph Caiaphas, and all the chief priests, that would be part of the Sanhedrin, the teachers of the law, the elders and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they couldn't find any. Many testified falsely against them. But their statements did not agree. Then some, some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days we'll build another, not made with human hands. Yet, even then, their testimony didn't agree. He was saying, hey, he's talking about the temple here. Your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Not by words, not by actions, not by deeds. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, this temple, when it goes in that tomb, I promise you in three days I'll be back. And for all of us, that's good news. He said, I'm coming back. It's okay. But the pain of him leaving even for three days. Could you imagine Jesus knowing no sin? Going to the cross and taking on the sins of the world. See, sin separates us from God. And for the first time in his life, I imagine he felt the loneliness without the Father with him because he carried my sins. He felt that loneliness that I felt till 1987 when I gave my life to Jesus Christ for the first time, and he said, Father, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? He couldn't feel him because of the sins of mine, of yours. For the first time, loneliness hit. I know that loneliness. That loneliness is what drives people to alcohol, to drugs, to homosexuality, and all kinds of sin. They can't feel that part of the puzzle that is Jesus Christ in their heart. But if they can receive Christ, that loneliness goes away. And you understand that God has a plan and a purpose for you. It wasn't just to come and to die. 
It was to give him glory. We have the answer in Jesus. People turn to the bottle because there's no hope. They turn to drugs because there's no answers. Number one suicide in the medical field is psychiatrist because they don't have the answer. I do. It's Jesus, the son of the living God. I have the answer. You have the answer. Let's share the answer. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Ah, here's where the rubber hits the road. Jesus can get out of this real quick by just saying silent. He doesn't have to answer. If he says silent, what are they going to say? But he goes, I'm going through this for you. I'm going through this for Dwayne. I'm going through this for Joe. <clears throat> I am, Jesus said. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of the heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? So let me get this right. You set a man up to get killed that was innocent. And you want to kill him over a lie? You know, I could be crucified over a lie. That's what they charged him with. Basically lying. And he took the cross for it. I hate to tell you how many times they could have crucified me for lying. They all condemned him as worthy as of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him. They struck him with his fist and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him when they should have been beating me. Sad. Oh, horrible. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of his servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You are also a Nazarene with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said. And he went on to the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow, he's one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them. You are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the words that Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. In the churches today, I believe repentance is required. If Jesus was talking to the church in America, I believe it would sound something like this. To the church of Laodicea and America, right? These are the words of the amen, the faithful, and the true witnesses, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one of them. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich. Sounds like America to me. I have required wealth, and I do not need a thing. But you do, know, do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich. 
and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful works and your nakedness. Saliva to put on your eyes so you can see. That's what I think he'd tell the church in America. All over the world, the church is persecuted for saying, I'm born again, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus. And in America, people won't say, I believe in Jesus, I am a Christian. Jesus loves you. We have the answer for everything. But we're not sharing it. Why? I don't know. I ask myself all the time. Why aren't we telling people about Jesus? Why doesn't our lifestyle reflect a Christian? Why are we more like Jesus? These are questions I ask me. Before I ever tell you guys anything, these are the questions I ask me. Where could I do better? Where could I be a better witness? How can I be a better example? These are all questions for Dwayne. Jesus loves you, but I want you to pay attention to some of the scriptures. Jesus is our great Savior, according to Titus. He's the bread of life, which we need to live on in John 6, 35. He is the light of the world in John 8, 12. He is the good shepherd in John 10, 11. He's the resurrection and the life in John 11. He's the way, the truth, and the life in John 14. He's the true vine in John. He's our redeemer in Mark 10. My deliverer in Psalms 18. You have the answer to every problem out there. So today I ask that you share that answer. I ask that your conduct, but being one that Christ looks down on and he smiles. He says, that's my child. So all God, I want God to say to me is, well done, good and faithful servant. It's all I need to hear. I already know I'll be crying. That's not a question. But you guys have the answer. And I'm pleading with you today. Share that answer. And if life right now is unbearable, and you're crying at night, and you can't find that sleep, I've been there. Grab a hold of his hand and don't let go. Don't let go. If you need someone to talk to you, Call me any time. Don't let go. Hold on to those hands. He will never let go. Only we can let go. Amen? If you need prayer, I would gladly pray for you, pray with you. If you're going through something that seems unbearable, I've been there in more ways than one. I've been there, but I promise you, he said he'd never leave you, nor forsake you. Amen? Let us pray. Father, you've been more kind to me than I've ever deserved, Father. I thank you for your love, the love you have for the lost, and the love you have for the people in this room, Father. It amazes me that you overlook all our flaws through the blood of Jesus. But I thank you so much in that. Father, I ask that you bless my brothers and sisters here, Father. Father, open doors that they can share the gospel of Jesus Christ to somebody out there, Father God. Paul always prayed, Father, about doors being opened, and it was shared Jesus. And that's the doors I ask for in my life, Father, and in my friend's life. Father, I ask that you bless their going out. In Jesus' name, amen.